Nestled next to the mountains in southern Colorado sits the Great Sand Dunes National Park. Colorado is most known for its beautiful conifer forests and vast mountains. So how on earth did this massive sandbox get here? I mean, literally, how on earth did this happen? You get it? There are a few other places in the U.S. where sand dunes reside, but none are as massive as the Great Sand Dunes. Most dunes are only 30 feet high. Maybe they'll get up to 250. But the Great Sand Dunes reach heights of over 750 feet. So what is going on here? How is it possible that these sand dunes have grown to such massive proportions? What you see as a giant sandbox is actually an incredibly intricate set of phenomena. Dunes this big need the perfect storm of events to form, and the story of how it all happens is fascinating. So first off, let's talk about what you need for a sand dune to form. You need wind or water, an obstacle, and, you guessed it, sand. Like, a lot of sand. Let's talk about the sand first. Okay, so I actually think that sand is insanely cool. And granted, maybe this is just because I was that kid in elementary school that would go to the playground, collect the rocks, and show everybody because I thought they were sick. <laughs> Sand is actually a bunch of different types of rocks that have been weathered over time by water into these teeny tiny smooth fragments of that same rock. When you pick up a handful of sand in the Great Sand Dunes, it's possible that there are over 100 different types of rocks in your hand, and some have even traveled over 50 miles from the San Juan mountain range to get there. Over thousands and thousands of years, rain, snow, wind, and other weather chips away at these rocks. They end up in streams and rivers where the water continues to break them up and smooth them. Basically, it's like the weather and the water sand them down. <laughs> then they're carried by rivers to a new location. In the case of the Great Sand Dunes, massive amounts of rock was transported from the surrounding mountains, the Sangre de Cristo and San Juan. This happened over the course of hundreds of thousands of years, but a lot of this rock ended up as sediment at the bottom of lakes that used to reside right where the Great Sand Dunes are today. Eventually, these lakes dried up, but only after collecting the 1.5 billion cubic miles of sand that fills the park. Now, like I said before, the sand here has over 100 different types of rocks in it, and around 50% of this is quartz. But there's also a big chunk, about 15% of volcanic rock as well, and a bunch of other rocks that I couldn't even pronounce, so we're just not going to talk about those. Now that we have our sand, the second component we need to make a sand dune is wind. The wind is a critical element in all this because it's what actually shapes the dunes into formations. The direction of the wind determines which direction the dune will face. Now, to understand this, we need to understand two terms. Windward and leeward. Windward is a side facing into the wind, while leeward is a side facing away from the wind. So basically, the wind comes in from a certain direction and carries the sand with it. It piles up more and more until eventually the mound reaches a tipping point. This causes a huge avalanche on the leeward side. You can actually tell which side is which by looking at the texture of the sand. The windward side will have lots of grooves, showing you that the sand is being pushed forward gradually. The leeward side doesn't have much texture. It's smooth, telling you that it's the collapsed side. Most dunes form in some variation of this happening, leading them to be maybe a maximum of 250 feet tall. But in the great sand dunes, there's something special happening. There's something unique about it, and that is the wind patterns. The prevailing wind in the park flows in the southwest direction, but there are also storm winds that come off the mountains that directly oppose this dominant wind. This combination of opposing winds send s This combination of opposing winds This combination of opposing winds send sand flying in from both to Wow, it's like a tongue twister. This combination of opposing winds send sand flying in from both directions, bolstering up their structure so they can grow taller before collapsing. The tallest dune in the park, appropriately named Star Dune after the type of dune that it is, is actually an even more special type of dune because it's exposed to even more special wind patterns. These dunes have three or more ridges because the wind forming them blows in from three or more directions. This really helps support the dune on all sides as it grows, so these types of dunes can reach massive proportions. The third component we need for dunes to form are obstacles, and these can be anything from plants on the ground to help trap the sand, all the way to the valley that the sand builds up in. The obstacles are basically the things that give the dunes a setting to grow in the first place. 
and the great sand dunes. Some critical but maybe easy to overlook obstacles are all the plants that surround the dunes in an area called the sand sheet. This area actually houses about 90% of the sand in the park, while the dunes themselves only carry about 10%, which I thought was a pretty cool fact. The sand sheet kind of acts as a storehouse that's constantly replenishing the sand dunes as the wind blows, and these plants help trap the sand here. And if that doesn't make sense yet, hang on, because we're about to go a lot more in depth. Now that we have a good knowledge base, let's answer some questions about the sand dunes. Number one, why don't the dunes blow away? Part of what helps the sand dunes maintain their massive size is that the sand there is constantly being recycled. Remember that the wind is coming in from the southwest direction, opposite the mountains. So it makes sense that the sand would just blow into the mountains and set up camp in the forest. The opposing storm winds do help keep this from happening, but they're actually just a small contributor. The biggest thing that helps return the escaping sand to the park are the rivers and creeks that flow down from the mountains. These creeks capture the moving sand and bring it all the way back to the park. They actually flow directly into that sand sheet I was talking about on the other side of the park. That's why the sand sheet houses the vast majority of the sand in the park, because all of the extra sand that's being blown off the dunes into the mountains is coming back there. And then, and when the southwest winds pick up, they blow that sand right back into the dunes. Question two, how old are the sand dunes? Most of what we know about the age of the dunes comes from evidence that we found by drilling into them, which, don't ask me how we do that because I can barely dig a hole at the beach. The sand on top that forms the dunes we see dates back to about 12,000 years ago, but we've drilled down far enough to find underground remnants of material from those lakes around 440,000 years ago. The deepest part of the dunes might be even older than 440,000 years, but we haven't actually drilled that far yet to see, probably because drilling into sand sounds like an incredibly frustrating and impossible process and people do have lives to get back to. Question number three deals with this phenomena that I had never heard of but is so cool called singing sand. When the sand topples over into an avalanche, it can make this really cool and slightly eerie humming sound. People call this singing sand because, well, it's like the earth is singing. How this happens is very cool. Just like how our voices make sound by pushing air through our vibrating vocal cords, falling sand makes sound by the air getting pushed through those tiny spaces between the grains of sand as it moves. It's the cumulative effect of many, many small things. Lots of tiny grains of sand moving, lots of tiny amounts of air squeezing through those pockets, but there is so much of it that it makes this very loud sound. Question number four is why doesn't the water in the creek dry up or sink into the sand before it reaches the sand sheet? So this is also kind of a cool fact that I found very fun to learn. In addition to the creeks flowing on top, there is also a massive underground aquifer full of groundwater that is what allows the stream to flow on top. So because the sand below ground is already saturated with water, the water on top is free to flow above everything without sinking down into the ground. So there you have it. That is the story of the Great Sand Dunes. And if you like this video, please consider subscribing because this is actually only episode two in an entire series I'm doing on the national parks. Here, I'll talk about the science behind the beauty of the parks and all the cool things that go into how they work, explaining them in hopefully a fun and easy to understand way. If there's a park you'd like to see me do, go ahead and leave a comment down below because I just might do it. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.